Okay, so the reason I started up and decided to come up with this topic was because I was told by a certain few members that my talk isn't allowed to have any relativity in it because it tends to confuse people and I get too passionate about such topics and will lose my track and get too much into the topic. Nothing was said about quantum mechanics, so I'm going to keep that into this lecture. Right? And, and the reason I actually picked this is because I assume that since it's such a big and complicated effect, the likelihood of a very small quantum effect will be very small. Right? But I was quite surprised to see as to how like deterministic quantum effects tend to be on all of these effects as a whole. So I'll be dealing with these three topics in general. What happens at the end of a main sequence of a star? How novas occur and how supernovas occur. Seems like a relatively simple topic, right? Three topics, how each of these occur. But it requires a little bit of information before that. Right? So where do we begin? So after star is lived, and the, how stars are born, how stars are built, this is a completely different topic as well. But now we're assuming the stars are shining well. And the sun in a few years or a few billion years after, will ultimately run out of the fuel it has to exist. And the star ultimately dies out. Why does it die out? Because the temperature and pressure for that particular mass simply doesn't match to run for the nuclear beam to happen. In that case, it, the core ends up getting compressed by the sheer gravity of it and the star dies. Right? So, slight detour right now. Explosions are basically the transition between the main sequence and the end product. And we know the main sequence relatively well. They are quite well understood. Let's understand what the end product is so we can understand how the transition happens. I want to deal with the transition, but it's important we understand what the end after the transition is. Right? So this is the general life cycle of the star. We have a nebula. It turns into a star. An average star is a massive star. Turns into red giants, planetary nebulas, or a supernova, depending on the kind of death it has. So this is what we'll be dealing with. And this is the end product. It's either going to be a white dwarf, a neutron star, or a black hole. Black hole which I've been forbidden from dealing with. So we'll deal with the first two. And they are actually far more interesting than a black hole when you look at it. So to understand this, I'll be dealing with this and telling you how this leads to that. Right? So it's quite interesting when you come to So what is a white dwarf and a neutron star? The fascinating thing about white dwarfs and neutron stars is they somehow know precisely to stop collapsing at a particular point. They somehow magically stop collapsing. Which is quite counterintuitive. You just think that, okay, given that now gravity is taken over, it will just keep falling and falling and falling because there's no fuel to push it apart. There's no, there's no internal uh, thermonuclear fusion to create the heat to stop it from collapsing. Yet, both of them stop collapsing. And that's quite a paradoxical thing because there's nothing to stop it from collapsing, right? It's hard to believe that, okay, I'm not fusing it into a single solid mass so tight that it can no longer collapse because it's managed to overcome all of these things, number one. And number two, this matter is no longer like a solid matter as you're used to, right? There'll be in usually plasma state. So it's hard to believe that, okay, they somehow just magically stop. It's something which is unheard, right? So, and more importantly, the transition from a white dwarf to a neutron star happens at a very, very specific point. And a neutron star to a black hole again happens at a very, very specific point. Something which is again quite paradoxical given the very complicated nature of these stars. It just doesn't make sense. Why? That's the question which keeps lying through all of it. Uh, like we are here and you are going through this. So let's look at what these are composed of. Right? As long as a neutron star is one point, less than 1.44 solar masses, called the Chandrasekhar's limit, or the like core is that much, it becomes a neutron star and a, a, a white dwarf and never a neutron star. Right? And there's a reason for that. It somehow stops at that particular point. The moment is more than 1.44, but less than three solar masses, it becomes a new, neutron star and not a black hole. Again, somehow stops at that particular position and when But it's beyond three, there's nothing you can do, it will end up becoming a black hole. Now all of this is, is hard to believe given the very precise nature of these numbers. Right? Why do these exist? Why do these happen? Right? First and foremost, they aren't made up of regular matter. They're made up of something called degenerate matter. Right? It's called either electron degeneracy or neutron degeneracy. I'll come, I'll come to that to explain what that is. <coughs> Basically put, it is the most simplistic uh, organization of matter you can ever have. You literally don't have electrons in complicated atoms or anything. You literally have electron here, electron here, electron here, electron here at different energy stages. It's just stacked like a set of bricks, right? That's nothing like any other matter we encounter in, in everyday life. There are a couple of things need to come, uh, need to like need to deal with right before that. First, these electrons are no longer behave like we conventionally used to. This is where the quantum effects start coming. Because they compress so close, 
all the atoms and all, I mean all the electrons and all the particles are so close together, you can no longer deal with them in a regular manner. Because now they are so close together that all the quantum effects start to come into picture. This is where you have basically two main quantum effects which you see. One is the Pauli's exclusion principle and the second is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And these two decide the energy and the position of the collapse of every single part particle in the, uh, in the star. This is basically what Pauli's exclusion principle is. It's as simple as that. It literally means every particle is unique, every particle is special. And what do I mean by that? Right? It means that okay, electrons tend to have a spin and in addition to the spin they tend to have an energy level. Pauli's exclusion principle states that if you have an electron with a particular spin, say a spin up, it cannot have the same energy level as another electron with a spin up. Basically, if it's spinning in this direction, it cannot be with another electron at the same energy state as this direction. It has to be in either this direction or it has to be like this at a different energy state. Right? That's the law of quantum mechanics. This exclusion principle has to be held in outward span. And that's something which decides the nature of the new form of matter which these neutron, uh, neutron stars, electrons, and uh, white walls are composed of. They mean that basically every particle has to be completely unique and they can't get overlap of identical nature of these two particles. Second thing is, this means that these are bosons. Bosons are in like regular matter. Bosons will be your, your fuel carriers and all these things. Photons, for example, you can have all of them bunched together right over here. Except fermions, which are like electrons, the broad category for, to which electron belongs to, means that they have to stack up again. I can't have all of them together because that means you will have all of them with the same energy and the same spin and the same behavior at the same time. Right? Something which is a big no-no in quantum mechanics. This means that, so because of uh, Pauli's exclusion principle, it means that all these electrons have to be exclusive of each other, need to be completely different and completely unique. The second thing, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It literally means this. The uncertainty in position, which is x, which is their position, multiplied by the uncertainty in momentum, p for momentum p is equal to mv should be greater than this particular value. So it's h by 2 pi, that's a particular constant. Right? Long story short, I can't know the well the exact position and exact momentum of a particle at the same time. <coughs> Something which I simply cannot know under any circumstances. Again, a fundamental law of the universe. Right? That's something which is like being demonstrated in this uh, cartoon over here. Because of the uncertainty which exists, you can't know your position and the momentum exactly at the same time. So, because I know my position, uh, I know my uh, momentum, I am somewhere in this region because there has to be some uncertainty in position, right? Which means to say like this, right? If I know that a particular particle has a momentum of say 7, 7 units, and the constant is say 14, I cannot know its position to an accuracy greater than value 2 because 2 into 7 is, is 14. More than 2, you would get a product which is more than 14, which would be a constant, right? So, it's very abstract, but literally that's what it means. So there's a better analogy I read and there's a book called Mr. Tompkins in Wonderland. It's a fascinating book. The book basically explores a man who is in a dream who goes to different worlds where the constant of the unit universe is different. So in one of his dreams, the speed of light is 50 kilometers per hour and he sees all the relativistic effects when he goes on bicycling to, to work. And all of these things uh, didn't happen. In one more of his dreams, he sees a world where the Planck's constant, which is this value over here is very, very, very small. It will be as small as like uh, so. Oh, sorry, very large, incredibly large, right? So if this is big, my uncertainties can be bigger. So I can know the values far, far better. So in that, uh, in that particular dream of this, he tried to take two uh, billiards tables and he put the triangle and he put it on the ball, on the ball in the center. But because he put the triangle out of the ball, he knew that the uncertainty of the position of the ball is limited to that triangle, right? And because that he's starting to violate it to greater than this constant. Which means to say the uncertainty in the momentum had to increase. So the moment you put the triangle in the ball in the tree, the ball started bouncing everywhere around the triangle. Like instantly bouncing everywhere around. Because now even though I know the position to within the triangle, I don't know I know the moment I have no clue about the momentum because the momentum could be anything around the region, right? So basically, because I don't know the, because I know the position so closely, I can't know the momentum right That's again one of the laws of quantum mechanics. Prove it, right? Very logical question. Like I could be lying about all of this right now. So let's try to prove this. So it's a quite a simple experiment. It's ridiculously simple when you think about it, but it actually works. So this here, 
is a screw cage. Right? It is a screw cage, micrometer screw cage. And here's a laser pointer. So what I'll be doing is I'm going to be placing this laser pointer such that it passes through the slit of the screw cage. So the slit is quite big right now. You can see the small shadow of the two ends. So I know this quite well. I like I don't I have a great uncertainty in this position in this direction. Right? So it the momentum can be known quite well in, in this direction as well. So I know that it's going to mind its own business going straight. The moment I start closing the slit, the uncertainty in the position in this direction becomes smaller because I know it has to pass within that small region only. Right? So because of that, I know it's going to pass only with that really, really tiny region. That means to say now by the equation. This is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. To equate this, this has to become bigger and bigger and bigger. Right? Now as I do this, x is becoming smaller, delta x. Therefore delta p has to become bigger and bigger and bigger. So now I know the position perfectly in this direction. Correct? But what I no longer know in this direction perfectly is the momentum. Which means I can go anywhere like this or like this. So it will go straight. But because I, I made the slit smaller, it started going this way. Because the uncertainty in momentum became far bigger. So hypothetically at a point, it would radiate in all directions. And that's kind of how point source lights work. That's the reason point source of light radiates even from the all directions. You can have a perfect like certainty in position, knowing all put on the left. And therefore the momentum uncertainty becomes infinite in all directions and therefore shoots in all directions. That's the one thing to behind that. Right? You can see a point source has become that huge. So that's what it happens, right? But the second thing you take away from this is that it resembles another equation which a lot of people have seen but wouldn't really connect to it. It represents an ideal gas law. PV is equal to constant gas. Which means to say, I can say, okay, as my volume becomes smaller, in this case this, <coughs> pressure has to increase. So you can actually say that every quantum particle behaves like an ideal gas. Where you have, instead of position, you have your pressure, and instead of momentum, you have your volume. It's The proportionality is the same, and the behavior is identical to that. And this is again some, going to be something which is very, very important when we deal with these white balls and neutron stars. And that's going to start answering the question why it doesn't fall upon itself. It's because of reasons like this. All right. So then the prerequisites, I just do it. Now, degenerate matter becomes easier to understand. Right? Now, because there's so little space for the electrons to take up, but they have to take up space and they have to take up energy levels, they will immediately start the spin up, spin down, spin down, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down. They pair up because they can only take two spin states up and down, but they can take up consecutive energy levels. Right? In a non-degenerate matter, they have a lot of space to take up. They just in a plasma for example, they take too many energy levels because they're hot and they have space to go up. So someone be here, someone be there, someone be there. Motors are compressing it. There's lesser space and lesser energy levels, and they start behaving like this. The volume decreases. Exactly. So that's what's happening now because of that. So how does it not collapse? Finally, answering the question because something called degeneracy pressure. All right. Just like how you can see the momentum, or something which is minding from business going straight with no momentum in the horizontal direction. So I have a huge moment in the horizontal direction and therefore it starts poking out. The moment I start reducing its size, its momentum starts going up. Which means to say the moment I push it inward, it behaves more like a point source of light. Which means it tries to go outward more and therefore they start shaking really fast. Like in Mr. Tompkins, in his dream, in, when you put the billiard, the triangle on the billiard ball, it starts shaking and moving and bouncing against the billiard ball, uh, the triangle in all directions. The moment you start limiting the uncertainty in position by compressing and reducing its size, the pressure goes up because the moment of every particle inside goes up. Which is why we have an ideal gas. The moment I reduce the volume, it means I'm actually reducing the uncertainty in position, which means I'm increasing the uncertainty in momentum, which means I'm increasing the pressure. And therefore I'm having something called degeneracy pressure. And so every time the neutron star or a white ball try to collapse, beyond that, the pressure takes it and stops it from collapsing. And that's how we actually manage to use it. And every particle would exhibit, right? Suppose I had a, a star composed only of, say, protons. 
or quarks. Quarks will have their own form of degeneracy pressure and they are actually hypothetical stars which exist. You know? Probably it takes transitions into neutron stars and quark stars and the particles which compose quarks and then I will become that. But these are all theoretical things. Okay. Second thing, why the, and again very important, more mass of a particle, the smaller it is. Okay. And that again comes in because of something called diploid is big, it comes to the size. Okay. So, diploid. Um, that means whether it's a proton or whatever, the more basic particle, quarks or the anything. Thing. Will have this behavior. Yeah. Even light has a behavior. But light is not limited because light is no. When you say gas, you are actually talking about this. It's actually particles. Ah. But these particles start behaving like an ideal gas, almost identical to an ideal gas. Yeah. The only reason light does not form its own form of star is because light is not a fermion, it's a boson. And so it can neatly all stick together as a boson. But the fermions are particles and they have to stack up. They can't all occupy the same space. There's one more interesting equation. Lambda equals <coughs> H by T. Okay. This is called the De Broglie equation, and it shows the duality of wave and particles which exist. Okay. The reason this is relevant is it explains why a neutron star is smaller than a, an electron star, as I'd like to call it, which is a white dwarf. Right. The reason is this: right? you can see this from this. More the moment, the, the momentum, smaller the wave. Correct. Mm -hmm. And the derivation is actually ridiculously simple. You, you get E equals M into C into C, equal mc squared. E is equal to HF, Planck's law, correct? So you take F is equal to C by lambda, C, C cancel, MC is, is equal to momentum, equal and momentum, mass into velocity, is equal to H by lambda. Interchange these two, lambda is equal to H by Derivation is literally as simple as that. But it's implicated with a massive. Now this means to say that if I have an electron with a particular momentum, or sorry, with a particular velocity, and a neutron with a particular velocity, the neutron will have a smaller wavelength, about a thousand times smaller. Because the momentum of a neutron for the same velocity will be a thousand times larger, because it's more massive. So more massive of a particle, smaller the wavelength. Correct. And when you're looking at from quantum terms, wavelength directly corresponds to its size. Because everything is into waves, and a more massive particle simply has a smaller wave, right? And therefore, like you can see where I'm coming from right now, neutrons have smaller wavelengths. Basically, neutrons have tiny wavelengths, whereas electrons have tiny, relatively more bigger wavelengths because the momentum is smaller for the same velocity. Correct. Which means to say. I need to compress a neutron, a neutron star, a far, far, far more to get the same amount of pressure in terms of uncertainty because I already have that much uncertainty because particles anyway that small. So now if I took a larger wavelength of light, say an ultraviolet light, I will have to compress the string far, far more to get the same. Which is why smaller the wavelength, you need to have a greater compression and a greater uncertainty in the position. Because as long as the particle is smaller, then your uh, the string really doesn't matter. Even here, only when you start coming into microns and like, when it starts like, getting in comparison to the wavelength, will my effects really start kicking? Because still then it really doesn't matter, right? Like even if the slit is really small, then the photon passes right through mining like as if nothing happened. When the slit becomes so small that now photons should wiggle through it, is when you need to take all these quantum effects into uh, into occurrence. And that's where again a neutron start happens because of this equation, a neutron wavelength will be very, very small. Which is why neutron stars will be so smaller. Larger, La more massive particles, massive. smaller masses. Because of that. Okay. Uh, like what? So that's more common, is it, than neutron? Sorry? Neutron stars are more common. Uh, kind of complicated, I can explain okay. what's more than neutron. Okay. Okay. White dwarfs. Okay. Okay. This is a reference to TV, I'm sure a lot of people recognize he is literally the white dwarf. So, what, what are white dwarfs right now? White dwarf basically after you understood degeneracy and degeneracy pressure, white dwarf is simply that point in time where the core collapsing happens to an extent where the electrons in the plasma of the star are now uncertain enough about their momentum to start moving around that fast that they start putting the pressure to stop the collapse. That's literally when a white dwarf is formed and that's literally where a white dwarf stops collapsing on itself. Because now I know these are there are that many electrons and that many energy states and an electron's wavelength will be that much. And for that wavelength, if I have that much of uncertainty in its position, 
because I have compressed it so close, the momentum uncertainty has become big enough to like oppose the gravitational fall, fall inward. And that's purely when the DJLX pressure kicks in. Whenever, I, like, it's perfectly analogous to when like the thermonuclear fusion starts in the start, when it gets hot enough to start fusing elements and pushing outward. Same way in this case, when it gets uncertain enough for the momentum to give its own pressure to stop collapse, that's when you have a white loss taking existence. That's the reason for a white loss, and that's why it gets formed. Now, neutron star. Right? And now, when do we form neutron stars? And this is again interesting. Thing. It happens when it is beyond the Chandra Shaker's limit, but below the TOB limit. Okay? Now, why do these limits come? And this is again quite an interesting thing, I'm quite intuitive once you've understood the basics of it. Right? So, a neutron star is basically a tiny white one. Instead of having electron degeneracy pressure, you'll have neutron degeneracy pressure. That's literally the only difference between the two. So, why do you have it? The reason I have it is, at one point of time, the amount of gravity which is there continues to squish it in, and no matter how much electron degeneracy pressure you produce, you simply can oppose this gravitational force. Correct? Right? In which case it continues to go smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And the gravity and the electrons keep giving you outward momentum, but it's not sufficient. And now it gets smaller and compared with the neutron. And our neutrons will no longer happen. Because the neutrons have their positions known to such fantastic accuracy now. And so the neutrons start wiggling like how these photons are wiggling outward. And just how, how the electrons are wiggling, wiggling around. But neutrons are far more massive particles. So the neutrons start wiggling around with the same moment, with the same velocity, they produce far more pressure than an electron do. And therefore, when an electron fails, the neutron takes over and the neutron starts wiggling around and starts pushing outward. And the second thing which is worthy to note is the neutrino burst, which uh, basically is formed because of the electrons have nothing to do. And they, they are known so well, the protons are so known so well, they end up fusing together. And to balance out the equation, you end up forming neutrinos. Like the equation will literally be E minus plus P is equal to N plus uh, neutrino, gamma, that's literally it. So, to balance out this quantum equation, you'll have neutrinos being expelled out, out of it, but ultimately you end up with neutrons. Because neutrons are the only ones which are small enough and massive enough to overcome that. The thing is, right, so ultimately, if I can have a white dwarf and have matter being sucked in, have matter being sucked in, and ultimately when the matter being sucked in is so massive that the gravity is not so strong that the electrons can no longer stop it. It falls into a neutron star. So it continues falling. And the neutrons take over neutrons have their own degeneracy very stable. Now, what happens if I load it with more? Right? If I continue loading it even more, even the neutrons are not capable of doing it. And there will be no force in the universe which are capable of doing it. If we ignore the theories which exist. Like theories which exist are like we'll have quark stars. Quark stars are what make neutrons and neutrons break up into these quarks and they are the same. Yeah? Uh, isn't it impossible for quarks to exist like unbound? Yeah, that's the theory, right? Like, as of now, the quarks as an independent particle have never been formed. But the point is this, you need to consider these conditions where you have such fantastic certainty in position. You know, you can make it's almost a pinpoint, right? I can pinpoint every single particle. In those conditions, electrons start using the protons, something which you wouldn't really notice in every day. Right? Atoms, electrons, and protons are whizzing about minding their own business and they don't really fuse. But at that position, at that point in, uh, in that status of a star with such gravity and such tiny sizes and such a density of matter, it would be thermodynamically more feasible to have quartz independently. Right? Ultimately, why does anything fuse or anything break apart? Because thermodynamics means that at the end, the energy will be less. The reason quarks fuse together into protons or neutrons and any of the other things is because it's easier and they take less energy together to stay as a group as to stay independent. Right? Like, uh, if I pour some water into the stuff, into the sun, because the temperature rises so much, it becomes more sensible for them to split apart into individual atoms. Right? So these conditions are incredibly extreme. And while quark stars have never been like actually like proven to exist. It's very possible that the quark degeneracy can always give you sufficient pressure. But yeah, these are all theories. So, as well, yeah? What happens to the protons? The protons use an electron. They give you a neutron and a particle. Electron neutron. So, when the neutron is expelled out, the protons can't fuse together with the neutron. Correct. Yes, but the neutrons have the electrons to worry about and they end up getting neutralized with the electrons. And lastly, what is the charge disparity in such a region when it starts pushing apart? So they fuse together. And then, uh, 
and the same level of nutrients in the No, they stay together. And they are different from the neutral star. The only thing they expand out is the nutrients. Because they are like charged teeth and they don't really interact with anything. So neutrino bursts are a good sign of a supernova happening because it means there's now a transition from a white dwarf to a neutron star. So now back to the topic. Finally, now that we know what the end product would consist of, this is a quite intuitive. Right? There are two possible things which can happen, or three if you consider hypernova as a special thing. You either have a nova, which is basically tiny explosions which keep happening, and this happens in pairs. Right? So when you have a red giant and a tiny white dwarf around it, the white dwarf keeps accreting matter into it, keeps sucking matter into it. And ultimately over time, because the matter gets sucked in so much, the surface gets really hot, fusion starts, thermonuclear fusion starts and start behaving like a star again with its own element being created. Because that happens, it has tiny little explosion and blasts all the matter out and with a huge flash. Okay. And the amount of like matter which is blasted is a significant amount. So not too much of the matter is sucked in by the white dwarf because the explosion happens in, the, in, in a shell around the white dwarf. What's interesting to note is every time that happens, the white dwarf gains some mass. Right? White dwarfs tend to become more and more massive over time. So it's very likely after a few noahs, you ultimately have a supernova because the electrons, the I mean the white dwarf has become more massive enough to reach a transition. And therefore a few noahs later you could have a supernova. And NOVA is quite stable, like there have been a couple of NOVA which happen every 30 years. Because like after that many years, it again cannot, can no longer sustain the fusion and fusion happens and explodes. So the moment the fusion happens, the gravity is strong enough to sustain it, so it just blasts up in a runaway reaction. And then it repeats, repeats all over again. So that's pretty much what a NOVA is, pretty simple. So it doesn't really go out of existence, it stays in existence? Yeah, nothing destroyed against the NOVA. It just sucks some matter, becomes hot and blasts it out. It's literally good. Supernovas, right? So, supernovas are very complicated to actually study. And there are two ways of classification. One is based on the spectrum, which is very precisely known, but very boring to actually study. Because you really don't know the reason behind it. It just means that, okay, it's bright for so long and then dims off for so long. The one I like more is this. The classification based on the cause. You can either cause it, if you can either cause by a core collapse, where the star, when it's finally dying, ends up in a supernova altogether. Or it can be caused by white dwarf accretion, which is like how a few novas later to have a supernova, or the first time it gets it ends up in a supernova, depending on masses. Right? So let's get into those. This is classification based on spectrum, based on light curves. This is a light curve. Type 1a is this, it will peak off to minus 90, minus 20, and then fall off over 80 days. Whereas the other ones you literally have that. So that's basically the light curves. That's how different classes of this type 1a, type 1b, type 1c. And 1a is the only type of supernova which is because of accretion. White dwarf accretion, white dwarf sucking into stuff in and becoming a new culture. All the remaining are because of four classes in there. So not much to actually see and understand unless you want to get into the hardcore like the reactions of it. So otherwise it's not too interesting. The more interesting is we see equation cause. So how does the type 1a happen? You have two normal stars. One ultimately becomes big enough to become a, a red giant and then dies and ends up leaving a white dwarf here. Now you have a white dwarf with another star and that star becomes a red giant after some time. Now this white dwarf starts sucking in matter and just like how we saw in Noah's, it becomes massive enough. So you can have a couple of Noah's and ultimately become a supernova or you can suck in sufficient amount till you reach a Chandrasekhar limit of 1.44 solar masses. So when this white dwarf sucks in sufficient matter to hit 1.44 solar masses, it can, the electron degeneracy can no longer sustain the mass and the gravity. And therefore something extra needs to come in where it collapses. The moment it collapses, it hits the, the moment it hits the neutron degeneracy pressure, the neutrons start taking over and that is stabilized at that point. The entire comp when the compression heats top up, the rebound will be another explosion and the explosion will blast in a huge massive supernova that will push and destroy the entire uh, fuel system. The interesting thing is, now I know that every time I say a type 1a supernova, I know it's a type 1a because of that curve. Every time I see that particular curve, I know it's caused by this, and I know that this white dwarf, or this neutron star now, after the supernova, is exactly 1.44 solar masses. Right? And that's brilliant, because now I know that a 1.44 solar mass explosion will give me that much intensity light wherever it happens. And therefore, if I see it from Earth, it's that faint, I know that it has to be that far away. And so, a 1A is a perfect, uh, like a yardstick in the universe. 
every time I say type 1A, I can pinpoint that is so many thousand like this. Like spot on, I know that 100 percent certain. That's the reason type 1 is a that type 1. Because it's a white dwarf, which then becomes a, a neutron star. And therefore, I know it is definitely 1.44 solar, uh, solar masses as the neutron star's mass. So that means uh, a neutron star that uh, you know it's paired with the, the super uh, uh, giant star. A white dwarf. A white dwarf? Yes. Okay. A neutron star cannot be found without a super dwarf. Yes. So a white dwarf is the only feature which will have it. Make it go through that stage. And then till it reaches that stage, yeah. it's it's a binary star. Yes. Right? So if you want to binary with a bigger uh, star, you know that it's, it could become a uh, black one. Yes. yes. So if it's a binary with a red giant, then it's a white one. So technically, this will be the most, more massive star yeah. because this died first. More massive stars always die first, faster. And then this ultimately reaches the scale of your red giant and then it sucks in till it hits the 1.44 solar masses and then it definitely be a supernova. You know that for a fact because that transition is very, very energetic. You're going from a very unstable state to a very stable state. So the huge instability needs to come out in the form of energy, which is why you have that precise feature. Now the core collapse, right? Two types of core collapses. You can either have an oxygen near magnesium core or you can have an iron core. Now both of these core collapses have a potential to either become a white dwarf or a neutron star. Or a black hole for the matter. Oh, it's not a white hole. A neutron star or a black hole. Right? So supernova is always given. So now, the interesting thing is this, right? Even if you have an iron core, I know you have read a lot of times, the moment you have an iron in the, nu in the nucleus, it's dead. The star is completely dead. That's not actually true. Only when the iron in the nucleus crosses the Chandrasekhar system is the star definitely true at that point of time. Because still then the remaining thermonuclear reaction in the shells is sufficient to sustain the star to keep surviving. The moment it hits 1.44 solar mass and an iron core, it will definitely turn into a neutron star and therefore it will start collapsing. So the shells will no longer be able to sustain the, the, the complete compression of it and then it starts compressing. Would you think for about 20, 20, 20, 20 thousand years, 30 thousand years? Not sure about the time. As with the iron core. Not sure about the timeline because supernovas last weeks as like visible. So, Timeline is very, very hard to predict because it depends on the shells which exist, the mass distribution shells, and all of those things. So that leads to very high complications. But again, this, this is what we ultimately care about: is the core. If core is greater than 1.44. It's a, it's going to ultimately definitely be a neutron star. Core greater than three solar masses, definite black hole. Core less than 1.44, white hole. The score is what determines it. Right? That's how core collapses came to happen, and that's what gives you all the other kinds of most of the others. Now finally, coming to the last two supernovas, which are personally my favorite. This is something which is a very interesting picture I found. This is an experiment done. It's a very, very powerful laser beam shot. And using like deflectors of the beam, they point it upwards. And this is a light object. They are levitating this object over here with nothing but the laser. Reason being, this light has this much energy and therefore that much momentum. And the momentum, as you saw in the right, light has its own momentum. This momentum is now being rebounded by this object, reflected back. And therefore, this momentum is sufficient to lift the object off. Object will be very light, right? Ah, sorry, object of course, light. Yeah, incredibly light. light. But point being that you are levitating something with nothing but light. light. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like ironic from the name's point of view, but object is being left, like levitated by light itself. Right. And this, they use that, like that's actually seen in a lot of cases, right? You can like, uh, solar sails and wind and light sails work on that concept. You have a very reflective surface uh, at, at the end of a satellite or a probe which you want to send. And the sheer momentum from the light will be sufficient to push it away. So this is an object which, which is being developed purely because of photonic pressure. Now photonic pressure becomes very important when you deal with really, really, really huge stars, right? Because these really huge stars now are producing pure X-rays and gamma rays at that core because of the sheer temperature and the energy of the reactions. And these are very high momentum uh, light sources. This means to say that it will start pushing the star away with that much more momentum. So in addition to the thermonuclear fusion which produces heat which is pushing it away, this photonic pressure already which is there from the star which is pushing it away. So you no longer only have like just heat which is pushing the star away, you also have the light pushing the star away from collapsing. So more the temperature, it's no longer going to be like, okay, temperature increases, so my pressure increases. Temperature increases, light increases, and therefore the light adds on to the temperature's pressure by giving a photonic pressure in addition to it, and that is another factor which stops the star from collapsing. 
So, pure light. Light and light only. Laser rose and supermassive stars. So, that's how these really, really huge stars come stay stable, even if they don't have sufficient pressure from inside to stay apart. The light itself pushes it apart. Right. Oh, quick thing, like, interesting piece of trivia, the light is seen from the sun, it takes 8 minutes, 20 seconds to reach from the sun's uh, photosphere to here. But it takes about tens of thousands of years for it to reach from the, from the core to the photosphere. Because of, it takes that many cycles for the photon to find the right. thing. And here, the cycles are now also going to be reflected in terms of these uh, the momentum at time, moment gets transferred to the next particle. So in general, start pushing through the part. So massive star have that. These start playing a role in the last two types of supernovas. Pair instability supernova. And the interesting thing about a pair instability supernova is that there is no remnant. No black hole, no white dwarf, no neutron star, nothing. It just vanishes, completely destroys its circumference. Right? Yeah. There's no remnant in the pair instability supernova. That's the reason I like these. So Let's compare the two, right? Like you have a really massive star, these are 200 ma uh, mass solar stars, like Eta Carina and all of these, which are really unstable stars because they're that big, they end up with this kind of supernova. But 20 so solar mass stars are just collapse, iron core, well behaved supernova. Like now, these will be considered well behaved. And real, these kind of ones, what happens when the, the, the collapse starts, the photonic pressure continues to exist. Because of this, the particles start coming so close together that you will have. You, you, they will literally start generating matter of their own, like a big bang. So the need, I am going to erase this. So an electron plus an electron, a positron, this is a positive charge electron, a beta particle positron, how you choose to call it. It's anti-matter electron, gives you, when fused, two into gamma rays. Right? Like this. That's what happens. So everything becomes a gamma ray. Yes. Except I don't have these. I have this. So the reaction goes back. So the reaction goes backward. And now I end up producing matter. Like the Big Bang. So at the time of the supernova, I actually start producing pairs of matter. Yeah. Uh, but then, will it be like the star will explode because of that? Not yet. It will come close. Because uh, first you create matter uh, from the light and then you create right. more light and then you create more. I, exactly. I'll, I'll, tell you why, I'll tell you what happens. So the moment this happens, these two gamma rays are no longer present. Correct? These two gamma rays played a huge role in preventing the star from collapsing because of photonic pressure. These two gamma rays prevented that photonic pressure, uh, the photonic pressure no longer exists and boom, they completely compress. They leave a lot of these pairs. These are very unstable pairs, and so the moment the collapse is initiated, there's no longer any gamma particles to uh, any form of like photonic particles that exist. So, this is a state of the universe, like we have a lot of positrons. Lot of positrons. That, that's almost because the only problem is you don't have a perfect matching between like matter and antimatter. Here there would be. So you will have that collapse. Except ultimately, <coughs> the the particles come so close together. That they get overloaded because now you are reaching, reaching something closer to each other in matter, where there is not sufficient space for them to move around. These particles start fusing together, which gives you this gaseous matter. So basically, it's like an internal combustion engine. You compress them together, then light the spark, and boom, it puts the whole thing apart. So whatever particles ended up being produced by gamma rays start becoming gamma rays again, and the remaining, there's no core to fuse into any particle. Which is why pair instability supernovas leave no part, no remnant, and their dynamics is completely different from the other common supernovas. The density and the spectrum of each other. Very, very bright. Incredibly bright ones. Because they are very, very energetic ones. They, they give you huge source of gamma rays. Then, are they the big, like, brightest supernovas? Yeah, one of the brightest supernovas. There's a recent supernova which was produced, which, like, there's a lot of conjecture as to why it happened. But this is possibly one of the reasons. But they say that there was a particle, there was a afterwards remnant which was formed, which uh, a magnetron which was highly high velocity rotation. So it's again pushing all the theories of supernovas to the limits, right? So this is the pair instability supernova. Any question? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't understand this. So this uh, this okay, because of the the light, uh, to get the two into gamma uh, uh, Right. Okay. Now you said that actually reverses back and produces that electron uh, 